If you were to be standing at this very spot 20,000 years ago at the same time of year, what do you think you'd see? Ice. <laughs> That's right. Okay. So 20,000 years ago, all of the peaks of these mountains in the area would have been completely covered in ice. And it was the glaciers that actually carved out the U-shaped valleys where the little Yoho River resides now. So, very significant. Perfect. Pardon? Perfect. Yeah. Here? Uh, probably 50 to 100 meters at this elevation. Okay. It's just an estimate. Okay, so 20,000 years ago, Canada looked like this. It's covered in the thick continental ice sheets, the Laurentide ice sheet on the east coast here, and the Cordillera ice sheet on the west coast. And this part of the world was somewhere in between the two thick continental ice sheets, up to about a meter thick, or sorry, a kilometer thick in places. So, 20,000 years ago, Canada was a giant ice cube. <laughs> and some people still say Canada is a giant ice cube but I like to think that things have gotten a little better over the last 20,000 years. Okay, so this is what the world looked like 20,000 years ago, what's called the last glacial maximum. So much of the world's water supply was tied up in the thick continental ice sheets, so the sea level was lower by about 100 meters, and as a result we can see New Guinea attached to Australia here, and all of Southeast Asia in one big landmass called the Sunda Shelf. And of course we have a land bridge connecting Alaska to Siberia. So sea level was lower, there was also more water tied up in the solid state, that there was less water in the liquid and gas phases, so there's less water in the atmosphere, less precipitation worldwide in the last glacial maximum, and as a result, we can see the deserts are more extensive and the rainforests more limited, okay? So, it was a colder and drier world. Okay, also want to point out most of the land mass in the world is located in the northern hemisphere. Can everyone see that? So the northern hemisphere has more continents and the southern hemisphere has more ocean and it is is it easier to grow glaciers on continents or in the ocean okay so it's easier to grow glaciers on land and why is that yes okay so you hear what this lady said so water has a high heat capacity and land has a low heat capacity, okay? So it's harder to grow glaciers in the water because water stores a lot of heat, right? Okay, and there's a few more things here. So in the water, there's also mixing and that prevents the formation of glaciers as well as, as transmission to depth. So the light is making it through to the lower layers in the water, whereas on land, there's a low heat capacity. There's no mixing or very, very little mixing and it's only interacting with a surface layer, so easier to grow continents, easier to grow continental glaciers than uh, sea ice. Okay, now here's another one of my fancy graphs. So, glaciers have advanced and retreated many times in the last few million years, and the advance and retreat of glaciers responds essentially to two things. So. There's accumulation of snow in the wintertime and melting of the snow in the summertime. That's another one of my fancy graphs here. So this is temperature on the bottom axis, and this is a measure of volume. And the blue line here is accumulation, which actually increases slightly with temperature until you get about one degree Celsius and then goes down again. And that's because as you increase temperature, you increase the amount of precipitation, and that is, of course, a very essential part for snowfall, right? You need to have uh, precipitation being supplied. So it's more or less flat line. Whereas glacial or melting increases exponentially with temperature. So as you increase the temperature, you melt more and more ice. The equilibrium point of glaciers is about negative eight degrees Celsius. So below that point, the glacier is set to grow and above that point, the glacier is set to melt. And it's kind of like your bank account. So in the winter time, you work like a dog and accumulate all of this snow, right? And in the summertime, it's really nice outside. You want to go on vacations and you melt it all the way right sort of okay okay but given that what do you think is the main driving factor behind the growth and decay of ice sheets is it accumulation of snow in the winter time or melting of the snow in the summertime I mean, they both play a factor but most scientists say that melting in the summertime is the main driving factor so it's like it doesn't matter how much snow you accumulate in the winter time. If it's warm enough, you can melt it all away and start fresh next winter. Okay? 
Everybody buy that hocus pocus? All right, so we're agreed, right? Okay, we'll come back to this later. So now I want to show you another graph which I actually drew myself. This is temperature over the last 20,000 years from the Greenland ice cores. So here's today, here's 20,000 years into the past. This is the last glacial maximum, and this is where we are today. The difference in temperature is about 10 degrees Celsius on average between now and the last glacial maximum. So the last ice age ended abruptly in two intervals. The older Dryas happened about 15 thousand years ago. That's named after this flower right here, the driest flower that I pointed out earlier. And uh, it brought an end to glacial conditions for most of the world, but didn't last. Glacial conditions returned to most of the world for the next few thousand years. And then another event, younger driest, about 12,000 years ago, a five degrees Celsius increase in global average temperature over the span of a few decades, brought us out of the ice age more or less for good. And the climate's been relatively stable for the last 10,000 years, what's known as the Holocene or the age of agriculture, if you will. So agriculture started right around the end of the last ice age, 12,000 years ago. Okay? And uh, we'll get back to that. Okay. Next, this is uh, another one of my favorite graphs. It's the last 500,000 years of temperature from the Antarctic ice cores. So here's today, here's 500,000 years in the past. This section right here, is the time scale that was covered in the last graph. So we're, we're really zooming out here. Uh, however, the last graph was from Greenland and this is from Antarctica. So we notice that uh, the signal is a lot similar, at least for this part of the graph. So it represents the global change in temperature over the last 500,000 years, more or less. Okay, anyways, right now we're in what's called an interglacial which is a brief warm period between two glacial phases of the ice ages. So this is the current interglacial here. This is the last glacial maximum, and this is the last interglacial before then. It occurred around 120,000 years ago, and then the previous glacial maximum. So it's said that the ice ages come and go in sort of a cyclical pattern, and the pattern seems to be a rapid warming to exit glacial conditions, followed by a gradual cooling into the next glacial maximum. Okay, rapid warming, gradual cooling, rapid warming, gradual cooling, what's known as a sawtooth pattern. And it's thought to be based on this. So the reason why the ice age ends rapidly and descends into the next phase gradually is because of the thermodynamic properties of water. So it's a lot faster to melt the snow than it is to accumulate. Okay, does that make sense? So that's why you have the rapid warming phase and then the gradual cooling phase. Okay, and it seems to follow about a 100,000 year cycle. That's the average time between two interglacial periods. Okay, so moving on, another one of my favorite graphs. This is the last five million years of temperature from the ocean sediment cores in the Atlantic Ocean. So here's today and here's five million years in the past. We can see that the average temperature has gradually cooled off over the last five million years. And ice sheets started to develop in the northern hemisphere around two and a half million years ago. Okay, but this is a very interesting graph. So before this time, we didn't really have so much oscillation. But as it's cooled down, it seems to have become more variable. And the oscillation seems to have increased in amplitude. Can everyone see that? So in the last million years, it seemed to follow the 100,000 years.